Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 37 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giulio, joined, as always, by Jordan Renan and James Cratch. After a 49-17 loss, the Giants go down in Minnesota, now 6-9 and on the season. We knew before the game started they were eliminated from the playoffs. Then the ugly game happened, making this week uh, kind of a strange one for the Giants, who haven't had to deal with something like this in a very long time. It feels like changes are coming. We'll talk about it and, and what we think might happen here with one game to go against the Eagles and then Black Monday in the NFL coming up on January 4th. Jordan, we'll start with you. Uh, that was Ugly Sunday, and now it sets up a really strange week as this, you know, this game doesn't matter at all coming up against the Eagles, but everything after that is what matters. Yeah, it was ugly. I mean, this team is now four straight years without the playoffs, three straight losing seasons. Uh, they have a coach who's turning 70 this offseason. Uh, you got to wonder, wait, where, does this, where is this franchise headed in regards to the direction of the franchise? And it's a question that we're going to hear plenty of. Uh, Tom Coughlin completely demoralized at his post-game press conference, maybe because they were down by 39 points at one point during the game, uh, factored into it. I'm sure it did. Think about that for a second. They were down 39 points, okay? Uh, but huh, so on top of that, it's, they all seem resigned to the fact that changes are coming. And the coach is probably the place that they're going to start. So, you know, let, let, let the games begin because they're going to hear about it now for till, till, a move, till moves are made or the owner comes out and says, uh, you know, gives his support for the coach, which – I don't think it's going to happen at this point. Yeah, that seems far-fetched right now after the way the season has gone, after the way John Mara was effusive last year around this time when the season ended that you know everyone was going to be accountable this coming year, which we are now uh, pretty much fully through here. James, for you, I know there was a lot of chatter Sunday night during the game and then right after it that maybe the Giants had quit on Tom. You know, Once they were eliminated on Saturday night, did they not show up? Was that just a bad night without Beckham? You know, things snowballed. They, when they had a game like this, not maybe not as bad, but they had a bad one in Philadelphia in mm-hmm. October. Uh, that reminded me a little bit of it when things started to snowball. In your opinion, effort wise on sa- on Sunday night, the game was irrelevant. But effort wise, did you think the Giants weren't there for Tom, or was it a bad night? I, I think it was just a bad night. I mean, I can't. You know, forty six guys were active on the roster. I think all forty six played. So I you know I just think I don't think they've quit on Tom. I just think they're not a very good football team. And they're really not a good football team when you don't have Odell Beckham in the lineup. And, you know, the Vikings had something to play for. You know, obviously they want to try. They can still win the NFC North. They got the big game in Green Bay uh, this coming week. And, you know, they had to clinch a playoff berth uh, because, you know, they, they could have clinched it before the game, but those other results didn't happen for them. So, you know, they're a young team that was at home against a team that was severely limited on offense, has nothing to play for, and, and they went out and they, they dominated the Giants, but I, I don't think it was a, a fact that they weren't playing for Tom. I, I think they all seem to love and respect Tom. I just think that they're not a good football team, and they ran into a buzzsaw on Sunday night. There was times where it was Ben Edwards and Matt Lacasse and Ruben Randall and Will Ty on the field as Eli Manning's weapons, and those are the guys he was throwing to. So it's going to be hard to succeed in the NFL when, when that's you know, what you're dealing with. You know, the ironic part is they ran the ball pretty well, and yet yeah. you know, they were still unable to do basically anything offensively. I mean, the passing game was just completely shut down. Eli played a really bad game. He was flustered right from the start. He was, and, and that, like you said, Jordan, there. I mean, some of the weapons he had out there, you can't even call them weapons here. And, and this week, you know, I, we're doing this podcast on a Tuesday morning, and Tom came out on Monday and said, blame me, blame me for what has gone on here, don't blame the players. And it feels like Tom is going to get the blame probably with his job here. But I wonder what you guys think. I mean, is this Tom Coughlin's fault? Ultimately, he's responsible. He's the head coach. And like you said, Jordan, a few minutes ago, they're now going to miss the playoffs for four straight years, six out of seven when you go back in the couple of years before they won the 2011, uh, the Super Bowl after the 2011 season. So it's been a while here, and that's – Ultimately, his responsibility of where the team goes and how they do wins or losses wise. But this year, do you think he could have done more? I mean, I mean, in terms of the, the what he had to work with, in, is this his fault? I guess is the is the ultimate question for you, Jordan. Is, is this well? That's a loaded fault? question. I mean, come on, you know, is it his? Is it all his fault? Of course not. I mean, the roster isn't great. Uh, the, you know, his quarterback played bad the other night, but he, he's actually played pretty well. 
Uh, the, you know, has Tom Coughlin done a great job during games? No, he has not. I mean, you want to look at it. I don't, look, is Tom Coughlin partially to blame? Sure he is. There's a lot of people that are partially to blame. There's, there's not enough talent. There's, the coaching wasn't very good this year. They lost six games by, what was it, four points or less. And some of the things that happened in them are, are absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, we've gone over all these losses. But if you think about it, I mean, think back to week one. Tom Coughlin, his team tried not to score a touchdown. Late in the game, that would have pretty much iced the game. That would ice the opener, and he didn't even know about it until the, until after the game. Like, think about that for a second. His team tried not to score intentionally, and the coach didn't know about it. I mean, to say he's done a great job and this isn't, and he's completely to absolve of blame because of the talent, I think, is kind of foolish. Now, has he done an awful job? No. I mean, he's got his guys to play. He's got this group to to perform fairly well. They were in games, but have they finished them? No, and part of that is Tom Coughlin's fault. Now, the reason why Tom Coughlin is going to be, the, you know, one of the likely scapegoats here is because the organization needs change. The system and process in which they're working with right now, let's be honest, is not working. This is the fourth straight year without the playoffs, and they're not trending in the right direction. And the other question I leave you with when we ask for Tom Coughlin, and you guys can answer this, did they? Are they really like? Oh, I mean, did he overachieve? He has Eli Manning, this is a quarterback, a starting quarterback in the NFL, and one of the best offensive weapons in the league. I mean, how many less games is he going to win if they go six and ten? I mean, is six and ten like overachieving with this group? I, I'm, I'm not really seeing that. No, I don't think it is. I mean, I, I think what you said there is fair. That he's partially to blame here, and and obviously, you know, he's the head coach, and that's where it all kind of falls onto, even if it's not all his fault. I guess to go off of that, and we'll go to James first and then back to you, Jordan, on this. The hypothetical I want to throw at you, because it's in my head here as we talk about Tom Coughlin. If Tom Coughlin had the same credentials, same exact credentials, and everything else was the same, except he was 58 years old or 61 years old, do you think things would be different? Do you think part of this is because, you know, his age, and maybe it's just time to move on, and it's easy to cite that as part of it. James, how about for you? Same exact coach, same exact credentials, everything's the same except he's 58 or 60, whatever. Is this different? That's a really good question, Joe. I mean, I think there could be a, a chance. You know, I, looking back, I mean, I think, like, Don Shula missed the playoffs four straight years when he was kind of in, you know, at that age range, you know, 58, 60 age range. Um, and, and obviously the Dolphins didn't part ways with him. That, that they had Miami had similar years to what the Giants have had these last four years, and then they had like one more kind of a different era. I mean, different we're, era. We're in a hypersensitive era now. That's very true. It's just it's so crazy, you know. But I was gonna say he ended up having one more little mini run. I think they got to like one AFC title game, won the AFC East like two or three more times. Had a wild card berth in there, a couple of ten win seasons. So I, I think it could be a listen. There still would be pressure, I think, on the Giants to make a move if Tom was 10 years younger. But, and I think maybe that would give him a little bit more leeway, but to answer Jordan's question about how they overachieved, I mean, I think all of us pretty much had the Giants pencil in for six, seven, eight wins at the start of the season, and uh, that's where they are. Um, Maybe we thought he was overachieving when they almost beat the Patriots on November 15th, but they're one and four since that game. So they've kind of fallen back to earth. And I would say the answer is no, they haven't overachieved. They've done about what we all expected. And most people figured that if they did what was expected of them in the off season, that the preseason, there'd be a change. So that's where we are. And I think when you look at it and how the games actually unfolded, they underachieved or they did less than almost what should have been expected because they were in those games, and ha- I mean, they lost six yes. games by four points or less. You, all you got to do, I mean, you got to win at least. You go two and four in those six games, and then all of a sudden, look, hey, you're, you're uh, you know, then you're in the eight win category, nine win category. Or already, you're in, you know, a different level of team, and I think that was right there, and that was fully possible. Joe, you brought up a really good question when we're talking about whether it'd be different if Tom Coughlin was, you know, fifty eight, fifty five, or, or even sixty. I think. The, you could approach it very differently. If he has two Super Bowls under his belt, he has this great success, you would hope that I, I, you would hope that the things that didn't happen in the game did, but you could, you could say, okay, 
we're going to change our process. We're going to get somebody to, to help on the in, with the in-game stuff. We're going to add, you know, uh, I know the Jets did it a while, a couple couple years back. I mean, I think it was under Herm. They had, uh, you know, what was his name? Dick Curl. I forget what his title was. Yeah, Dick know what Curl. his title was? You know, like, he was basically uh, the uh, time management system. guy. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Whatever. He was his job was basically to to watch the clock and handle that kind of stuff. But you can you can add roles, uh, alter roles, alter the way the team does the draft, alter the way the team uh, handles free agency and analyzing pro personnel. Uh, they can make slight changes like that and say, okay, we're going to do a, re- a little mini rebuild here. Maybe not even a rebuild, a, 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 a mini makeover. And Top Coughlin can be there because it's a five year plan. We have five years. We're gonna we're gonna turn this over. And you know, realistically, we're not going to be able to be a Super Bowl contender in one or two years. So years three, four, and five are kind of our goal. And you can have Tom Coughlin as part of that. But you know, are you really going to do that with a guy who's seventy years old at this point? It almost doesn't make sense. And on top of that, when you look at it, I mean, I know people are like, "Who are you going to get better than Tom Coughlin?" But if you take away everything before, you take away the resume, and you look just on the service at the job he did this year. And you say, who can you get that did a better job than Tom Coughlin? I'd say, there are people that could do a better job than Tom Coughlin. There's plenty of good coaches out there. There's you know, plenty of coaches who would have recognized, who would have made sure their team tried to score in the opener or would, who would have noticed the shenanigans that were going on with Odell Beckham for three quarters. So you know, there, there are ways to pick apart Tom Coughlin's performance, just like there is every coach every year. But this year they stood out a little bit more. And in these close games, in a league where there's – such a small room for error that, you know, these kind of things make the difference. And it, you could easily make the argument, and I would make the argument, that it did make the difference this year from them winning eight, nine games and then winning six or seven games. That's and a good I, point you bring up there, Jordan. There is fallacy in that the way people say that, like, you can't do better than Tom. Well, eventually you're going to have to try, and eventually the hope is that you do or at least match him. I mean, you could have made a case that they'd never do better than Bill Parcells. Well, Tom's gotten pretty close to matching him, if not exceeding. And then I'm sure when Bill Parcells left, people said, well, they'll never, they'll never find a coach better than this. Well, I and mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you have to eventually move on. Yeah, and if you're going to go by that line of thinking, I mean, would it, would you're going to go until he's 85 years old because he still wants to coach. And, you know, he's, he's, yeah, if he's a terrible coach, by then you're, you're still going to be saying, oh, well, he won two Super Bowls and he was great five, six, you know, 15 10, 15 years ago, not even five, six. That would be a long time, eighty-five. But you get, I think, I think you get my point. Right. What were you saying there, James? No, I was just going to say that with Tom's age, it's not that. Oh, he's seventy years old, so like you, a seventy-year-old can't coach in the NFL. It's just that, as Jordan said, you know, when you have these extended three-year, five-year plans, I mean, I don't think the Giants are going to be ready to win the Super Bowl in the next three years. So. For them to say, okay, we have this extended plan and we're going to contend for the Super Bowl when Tom is the oldest coach in NFL history, it's just not something you can, I think, knowingly decide as your, your plan of action because there's just so many variables involved. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there is a lot of variables in the Giants. Have but to you brought up, uh, sorry, Joe, but you, Joe, you bring up a big thing, James. If they're not ready to win the Super Bowl for you know, three or four or five years, I mean, what are you doing with Eli Manning? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you got a 35 year quarterback. Are you gonna you're, you're looking to win when he's 39 and 40. Seems like a flawed plan to me. Well, they have to hope they can win sooner than James's timeline. And James, you might be right, but I'm sure John Mara and and Jerry Reese and whoever the next coach is, if indeed this does happen the way we're kind of alluding to, they all have to hope and plan that they if this isn't a three year plan because otherwise Jordan bringing up Eli's age is is an apt point. I mean, then then what the heck are they doing? Yeah, no. you don't you don't want to go. Yeah, go ahead, James. No, I was. I mean, look, maybe the Giants can contend. I mean, they have to hope they can contend within the top, the the, para- the natural parameters of Eli's you know final years of his career. But um, you know, as I said, it's just even if you said, okay, we're gonna be we're gonna you know be back in the playoffs next year and we're gonna be ready to roll in year two and in year three. Well, Tom would be the oldest coach. It would be tied for the oldest coach in history of the league at that point. You know, and okay, so let's say you you get to the NFC title game two years in a row and you don't win, which has happened to plenty of teams before. What do you do at that point? Right, this was they're gonna hit. This was gonna come to a head at some point here. It just happens now that they are coming off of four straight years out of the playoffs. Now, a few minutes. Yeah, ago, forget, friends. Let's say forget age for a second, Joe. I mean, they, they're four years without the playoffs, and the coach didn't do a good job this year. I mean, I I don't know how you're gonna sit there 
and argue that much otherwise. I mean, look at the games and how they unfolded and some of the things that unfolded in front of our eyes. He didn't do a great job on the field this year. He didn't, and, and that is, is the, the larger point, and the biggest point here is the Giants probably feel like they have to make a change. Now, there's a lot of conjecture, a lot of talk about other changes they could or should make, whether or not it will happen. And we talked about how much of blame the 6-9 and nine season here, four straight years out of the playoffs, falls on Tom Coughlin, the head coach. How about Jerry Reese? Now, I, I don't get the sense his job is, is really in danger or anything close to the way Tom's is. Should it be? I mean, as far as Reese... And his tenure here, he has two Super Bowls just like Tom. He's obviously much younger, and it's just a different realm. Uh, and the Giants still probably want to make wholesale changes and replace everyone. But what about the job Reese has done in, in supplying Tom and the coaching staff talent? James, uh, Jordan, we'll start with you on, on Reese and, and your just thoughts on the job he's done. Yeah, I mean, there's no way around it that they have not done a great job. I mean, look at the talent on this team. It's It was not sufficient. In my opinion, and I... I I've been thinking about this a lot lately, is the biggest mistakes that they made this offseason were not having good contingency plans for Victor Cruz, not having a good contingency plan for John Beeson, and number three was not having any real plan, it seemed, at safety. And it really downed this team. The drafting over the last, you know, a couple of years has been all right, but we all know about the, the, the wasteland of draft picks from what was it, uh, t- 2010 to 2013, when we're talking outside of the the top two two rounds, I mean, pretty much, and even the second round has is, is been pretty hit or miss. Uh, I mean, Hankins seems to be pretty good for them, but aside from that, Hankins was a second-round pick, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but aside from that, you know, I mean, the years before, rounds two to seven have been just a complete wasteland. Now, I granted, I know you have to give them credit for guys like Victor Cruz and even... Uh, you know, Spencer Passengers of the world and uh, Mark Herzlick, you know, guys that you're able to get as undrafted players and have contribute to the team. But, you know, they have not done well enough in the draft. They've done pretty well in the, in the first round, which is ironic. It's kind of strange that they do well in the first round, and especially in relation to other teams, and then not so well the rest of the draft. So they have to review their process there and say, why did we not have, why do we, why did we not have success? I know they, they, th- they say they have, and they've altered the way they kind of did it a little bit, and uh, maybe the results have showed in the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, there's an overall lack of playmakers. Now, on the other side of it is they had some major blows, and I know you don't want to use injuries as an excuse, but the, they, when they constructed the roster for this year, and I'm not being a Jerry Reese apologist here, but I think this is reality. When they constructed the roster, they had their impact defensive player as Jason Pierre-Paul, and then he blew off his hand in a 4th of July weekend accident, and there's no way to re, you know, for them to go get a, a replacement for him at that point. So that really threw them for a loop. They also had Will Beatty as one of their starting offensive tackles, and then all of a sudden they lost their starting. So they basically lost their top defensive playmaker and one of their offensive tackles before training camp even started. And, that, and those, are, those are big blows. I mean, those aren't just little insignificant blows. Yeah, and I was going to say, there's not, there's not, when those, Beatty and then Pierre Paul, I mean, there's not really a, a, a market out there to go make a, a late acquisition to, to fix that problem. You kind of, you know, like, listen, I, I don't think Marshall Newhouse has had the best season at right tackle, but they didn't get Marshall Newhouse to be their starting right tackle. They brought him in to be a, a backup, a swing tackle, you know, the, the pitch in and a pinch here and there. And, you know, they suddenly had to put him in the starting lineup. You know, that's not something they planned on doing. But, you know, when Will Beatty gets hurt that close to the season, you don't really have a choice. Right. And they were stuck there. I mean, they were stuck because they had guys that they didn't want to have to play. They'd have to play. I mean, they lost big players and it and the depth behind them just w- wasn't enough there. And, and Tom and the whole team and the fan base felt the wrath of it. So now that we look forward to this game coming up, Eagles and Giants, and there's all this speculation, we're doing it right here, and everyone's wondering what's going to happen next week with Tom. James, you wrote a piece on NJ.com about how the Giants should handle this if they've already made a decision here. If they haven't, they haven't. If they decide next week, they decide next week. If they have made a decision, do you think they should say something, tell Tom, tell the fans so they can say goodbye? I mean, where do you think that they should go with that? My guess is they're not going to do anything like that, and we'll just watch the game and, and see what happens yeah. afterwards. But, James, so you know, is that what you think? 
Yeah, I just think that, look, if they've made a decision and the decision is that they're going to make a change, there's no reason to have the next, you know, we're, we're p- taping the podcast on a Tuesday, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Tom will meet with the media, players will meet the media all three days, and then Sunday after the game, of course. There's no reason to just keep on, for me, just in terms of Coughlin and what he's done for the franchise, to put him in a position where he has his extended, you know, for lack of a better term, march to the guillotine. I mean, if this is the case and, you know, it, he's going to move on, then come out and say it, you know. I mean, look, I think that the last four years have been very tough on the Giants, but the first eight years were pretty darn good. You know, they won the Super Bowl twice, playoffs. You know, he's meant so much to their organization. You know, he deserves to go out, I think, with dignity and class and with respect. So, if if he's moving on, and, and I, I definitely think the fact they're playing an Eagles team that has got nothing to play for and has w- even more internal strife, arguably, than the Giants have, um, you know, give the guy a chance to go out on his field a winner. I mean, this, there's no reason to have him, you know, kind of just take a thousand paper cuts over the next week and then lose his job. You Is know, he going to be go willing out. to do it, though? I, that's a great question, Jordan. You know, obviously, Tom yesterday said, you know, blame me. He doesn't want the players to have to feel bad for him or have his status be a distraction. And I understand where he's coming from, but at the same time, this week's going to be about him no matter what. Good Good point. But here's the thing, James. Here's the thing, James. He, what if he's not going to go quietly? You know, what if they can't, you know, what if, you know, the giants don't aren't look, they don't want to fire him. No, they they don't want to have to go through down that road and make this ugly. But what if he is not, going to cooperate i mean that's just something you know like what if he wants to stay what if he's going to force their hand what if he's going to force them to fire him? which I mean, isn't a no, possibility that he no, does, it's i mean not, no it's not yeah, can no. anyone see tom coughlin you know sticking his leg in, in the ground and saying i'm not moving <laughs> you know of course and, so, I and see forcing that. them to make a move i mean it's not out of the realm of possibility no I mean, it's it, not I just think you, if you're a Giants fan, you would hope that the two sides of this equation, ownership and Tom, if this is if this is gonna, end, it's gonna be, well, ultimately the only per, only two people that really probably know what's gonna happen for sure are John Mara and Steve Tisch. And if they know that they're gonna have a new head coach next year, you would just hope and think that it wouldn't get ugly. Yeah, you'd hope that. And just looking forward to to Sunday's game, my feeling is there's going to be a scene in that place one way or the other. I mean, I feel like the fans are going to have some sort of display for Tom unless something changes between now and then with an announcement, like we're talking about, or the opposite, that they're keeping him. Barring anything like that, to me, I I can envision one of two things. You know, a thank you Tom type of chant where it's almost like a goodbye, or if they're playing well and whatever, something happens there, uh, uh, don't fire Tom, or something like that. I could, I could see the fan, not that it would really do anything and change the decision, but I, in my mind, I could foresee the fans having some sort of goodbye or, or try to have some sort of final say uh, for Tom unless something happens here. I mean, that would be quite a, quite a scene to watch, wouldn't it? That would be quite a scene to watch. I mean, <laughs> you know, and it was deserving. I mean, he, this is a guy who's been here, what, 12, 12 years and won two Super Bowls, and that's a good run no matter how you cut it in the NFL. And it doesn't matter how many years they missed the playoffs in the rest of those 12 years, and I don't think anybody cares, and you shouldn't. Because you win two Super Bowls in a 12-year stretch in the NFL, you, you had a really good run. And, uh, you know, you deserve a, a good, you know, going out party, and this, this is an opportunity for it to be it, uh, you know. Some people just, uh, you know, you know, you know, you always have that person in the family. Don't throw me a party. I don't want a surprise party. Well, Tom Coughlin seems like that kind of guy, you know. Yeah, I, I don't want I don't want you guys to give me this big send off. I don't want that party. Let me just go out. Let me just go out, quiet, you know, like like I always do, you know, my own way. Let me just and, go you know, through my routine, my normal Sunday. Let me just let me do my thing until I can't anymore. I, let me I, be I, my normal curmudgeon self over here. <laughs> well, I, and I, I can that. respect that, but I I just would think that you know, I think in cases like that, so you know, sometimes the person that you're trying to honor. It's bigger than that person, and I think, in a sense, you know, Tom Coughlin leaving the Giants could be bigger than you know just the simple idea that he's not going to be the coach anymore. Yeah, it could. Fair, and, fair, yeah, and fair I point. think it probably is to a lot of people, and probably is to the Giants as well. So 
as we look forward here, I mean, the game itself. Let me just say this, Joe. But I also think this, and this is, you know, not on the personal side, but I think most fans at this point are ready to move on. I, I, you know, that's the, the sense you get. Even even the Coughlin supporters at this point, for the most part, aside from like the ex players who are coming out to defend them, because what are they going to do? They're not going to go throw their old coach under the bus. Uh, even they've come to the realization that it's probably time to move on. I get that feeling too. The sense from fans, this is the first time where it's I, it, almost the, the feeling is, I love Tom, but it's probably time. It, it, I get that feeling um, when I listen to fans and, and listen to what, you know, what they have to say here. So as we look forward to Sunday, the game itself is meaningless. The only thing will be you know, second or third place in the NFC, so trip to London or Seattle next year, that kind hey, of Hey, hey, that's big for some people, Joe. Well, yeah. Ball. For like you guys. So you, so you guys want to go to <laughs> I've London. Never been, I've never been to London in my life. I, yeah, so I'll, I'll take, we know what you guys I kind of take for. that trip. Right, all right. So the, we know what you, where you guys are, want this game to go on Seattle's Sunday. Seattle's not a bad consolation prize, though. I it mean, is really, for the Gi- it is for the Giants. Yeah, but I'm talking. I'm not worried about this. I'm, this is a personal thing, Joe. Come on, <laughs> I'm worried about worried about my own happiness and trips. Come on, and your expense report. Hey, it's going to be expensive either way. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I mean, you know, the, the one thing that, that it's kind of interesting about the Giants' potential schedule next year is with the way the rotation works. Their, their current road games are the three games in the NFC East, of course. Green Bay, Minnesota, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. Uh, not exactly hot Give us spots. one. Give us one. Come on. That's what I'm saying. So Give us a break it, like, here. Ha- having London, I mean, it'd be kind of strange to have London be the number one road trip destination. And then number two would be uh, Cleveland? I don't know. I mean, yeah, so it'd be, a, it'd be a weird-looking road schedule if they're There'd going to There'd be a to ton, a ton, a ton of Giant fans making that trip to London, by the way. Because yes. especially when, like James said, you pick that one trip a year and you look at the schedule and uh, – you know, Cleveland, Cincy, that's not the best division in the world to have to play. Uh, so, you know, London, hey, that was, uh, maybe London. That's, that seems like a pretty good trip. Let's, uh, let's go do it. Yeah, that would be fun. So, you know, that, that all depends on who wins, who loses Giants-Eagles on Sunday. As we look forward. The London we, Bowl. That's what we'll call. We'll call or, it. and just for the Eagles side of things, assuming everything holds out and people get signed, Bradford Foles in London. Oh, wow, I didn't think of that. that. That one's got its own Chip Kelly yes. spin on it. So that will be decided by a win or loss on Sunday. And then after that, next week, Black Monday, or at some time, we'll find out the fate of the Giants regime and what they do with Tom or anybody else, and then we'll, we'll react to that. But before we get there... Let's, because... talk about, let's talk about Jerry for one more second before okay. we go. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're not, I'm certainly not downplaying that. I don't think the roster is good enough. But the reason we're not harping on Jerry here is because, hey, they've never fired... General managers. I mean, James, when's the last time they fired a general manager? I mean, I, I can't even tell you. The, I think the last time they changed the coach and the GM in the same year was like 1970s somewhere. I mean, they really haven't hired a GM in decades because if you think about you know, George yeah. Young was kind of put upon the franchise. And then exactly. Ernie Acorsi and Jerry were both promoted from within. So it, it's, it'd be kind of an unprecedented move if they were to let a GM go and then go out and hire an outside person. Yeah, and from what we've, I've been hearing is that, you know, the, the GM is likely going to stay and that they're not going to make a move there and that they're going to make a change in the head coach. So that's one of the reasons why we're not quite harping on Jerry Reese as much as we are on Tom Coughlin. And, uh, you know, they, they both are certainly, and, J- and Jerry's whole staff, and the, you know, the, the Giants are an interesting organization because there's multiple arms in there. It's not just Jerry. So it's hard to know who's responsible for what, who's responsible for what signing, I, in, in the end, it all lands on Jerry, but there's another pro play per, pro, uh, pro player personnel department that seems to be run by Chris Mara. Uh, you know, there's you don't and they they're involved in the draft also that little you know separate arm it seems. So you're not sure who to pinpoint exactly what on. In the end, it all falls on Jerry's resume, and I think that's fair because that's the job he's in, and that's that's the responsibility. Sort of like the head coach, you know them. Or all this stuff falls on him. Same with Jerry. So, uh, you know, it's hard to see there. And now I think there'll, there'll be some changes there I would, I, on the, the front office part. Just not sure where and not sure who. But it doesn't seem like it's going to be with Jerry. It's amazing as you, you guys detail the timeline of their past GMs and the fact that they don't change them and continuity and kind of one guy begets the next guy in terms of, you know, promoting from within. I mean, George Young took over as Giants GM in 1979. So they really haven't gone outside and hired anyone to do this job in a very long time. 
which is it, it's amazing considering turnover in the NFL now. Um, so that obviously hovers over the Reese thing now. With Tom, He's, and Reese, it, has been, Reese has been with the organization now too. It's not just he hasn't just been with this uh, what eight nine year run as general. Right, he's yeah. there under a Corsi, right? Eight, Corsi was there yeah, under not, he was there under ninety since ninety four. So you're talking about a guy who's been with the organization for twenty plus years now. Right, he's a giant. He's not just some guy that worked for the Giants. He's been he grew up with the organization, which obviously they don't fire guys that have been with the organization twenty something years very often. Just no, they, they don't. So it, it would be it would be a major major. Shocking surprise, and everything you hear is that it's not, it's likely not going to happen. So, with our hypothetical, then to end this episode, we'll leave the GM out of it. And if it becomes an open spot, we can come back to it next week and talk about it. But for right now, if we go on the assumption or the thought that this is Tom Coughlin's last game with the Giants and they're probably going to make a move after this, in your minds, what's the best case scenario or a name to watch or, or someone you think could be a good fit as a head coach? And really, probably with the roster, that, that includes Eli Manning. That, he has to be part of that, considering you know, you, you're not going to run a, a read option offense with Eli Manning. So all that considered, give me a name you guys have thought about. I'll, I'll start. The one that I've thought about for a while, and I've, I've actually seen his name brought up um, by a bunch of different people recently, because I always thought he deserved a second chance, and I think he'll get one eventually, is Josh McDaniels. Now with the Patriots, was the head coach of the Broncos very young. It didn't work out. Drafted Tebow. I always liked him. I thought the Tebow thing did him in in Denver. I think he deserves a second chance. Not sure if the Giants would be it, but that's a name I had on my mind. How about you guys? It uh, doesn't hurt that he has Bill Belichick in his corner, though. When Bill Belichick calls and puts in a good word, there's right. a couple of people that John Mara really respects, and Bill Belichick is very much near the top of that list. Now, the thing with McDaniels is apparently he's a quirky guy. He's a, he's not, he's a little different kind of guy. So we're not, not sure how that would play with the Giants or – in the New York market, but I think that has to factor into that equation if that has a realistic chance of happening. Definitely. I mean, it, James, you know, who do you got? Well, you know, honestly, I think from a, from a Giants front office perspective, I think the, their best case scenario would be that they wake up and they look themselves in the mirror and say, Ben McAdoo is ready to be our head coach. So you keep Eli in this offense that he's, he's succeeding in and you go from there. Um, and, you know, he potentially keeps Steve Spagnuolo around, and you kind of, you know, have a fresh start with many of the, the th- trappings of the past still there. But um, for me, I, I think, you know, Jordan's brought up David Shaw, the head coach at Stanford before. And obviously a lot of people say that he's not, he's going to be hesitant to leave college. But, you know, when you look at every, he has everything that you kind of want an NFL coach, and he's only 43 years old, which I didn't realize until recently. So, you bring if you can convince a guy like David Shaw to come east to the East Coast and be your head coach, he could be your head coach for the next twenty years, which you know it seems the Giants kind of aim to do sometimes. So yeah, I there think are definitely that, people in the organization that like David Shaw. So I, I think he'd probably be the dream candidate because he's a guy that you know you could potentially tell yourselves as you sign him, we're going to have a Steeler esque run here where he's going to be the coach for a long time and we're going to be good for a long time. Yeah, since we're dealing with dream scenarios here, uh, absolute best case. I, my, I had two in my head. One was David Shaw, and I kind of wanted James to see if James would take him because I have another one that's even more outside the box that I was thinking about. And James actually mentions this to me along the way, who, you know, last past couple months or so, is Urban Meyer. Yeah. You know, this is a guy who basically has done everything except for go to – NFL and light up the NFL and succeed on the NFL level. And, you you know, Urban Meyer wouldn't leave Ohio State for anything, but definitely not for anything but a top job. And to go and get the, the Giants job, I think that would be an interesting one. And to see Urban Meyer in that spot, uh, you know, in the Giants role to go in there, take over. He's a very, very well-respected offensive mind. I think, he, you know, he would – be able to take Eli and have a lot of success with him, even in a short period of time. And, uh, you know, there's nothing you can really say about Urban Meyer as a coach that says, hey, this guy is an absolute stud. Uh, you know, if he's friend, you know, Bill Belichick keeps company with very smart people, you know. Uh, and Urban Meyer is one of those guys that he, he's friendly with and that he keeps company with. And there's another guy who would get a, another, who can get a, a good recommendation from Bill Belichick. Plus, has the head coaching resume to back it up even more, way more than like a Josh McDaniel type. So, to me, you want a dream scenario 
Urban Meyer would be a pretty awesome hire in my estimation. Yeah, that that would be uh, that would be one that definitely would get people the, the eye, their eyes would open. I mean, the guy is one for sure. and twenty seven as a college coach. Just, he's done it all, like you said. I mean, and the, he brought Utah to the to the BCS championship. You uh, no, the BCS you know, BCS games. Utah, okay. Right. Yeah, that, that guy on. can coach him up. He really can. He's the best coach in college football, right there with uh, with Saban. And it would remind me if that if that happened, Jordan, or he became a candidate. And I know this guy I'm going to mention is not having the greatest year right now, but it would be similar to what the Eagles did by going to get Chip Kelly. You get the right. best and most exciting college coach, and it invigorates people. And uh, obviously, Chip but even had- Chip, you knew kind of like it, it was known that he was like interested in doing that. That mm-hmm. that you know that has been brewing for a couple of years. This would be even more out of the blue because you don't hear it much with Urban. Really don't. Yeah, I think Urban's the type of guy who like. There's all, there's very few. You can count the number of franchises I think in the league on one hand that could call him and legitimately think that they weren't wasting a phone call. And I think the Giants are definitely one of them. Yeah, I, just for the, the purposes of talking about it, I hope he becomes a candidate because that, oh, that would be, be fascinating. Yeah, it yeah. would be awesome. Be yeah, that would be fun. Everybody would be into that. So and then now, even I'm, better, I'm going to be thinking better, about wait, wait, wait. this. Then even better, Greg Schiano could take over at Ohio State. <laughs> oh, <laughs> NJ.com would have a field day with this from top to bottom. Oh, yeah. Steve Politi's, like Christmas miracle. That's Steve Politi's dream. <laughs> and obviously, just real quick, like the, the, the total far-flung dream, I mean, this is never going to happen, of course, but if they could somehow convince Bill Belichick to come home, I mean, there's a zero point. There's a negative 100% chance of this happening. But that probably would be the dream of dreams if you're the mayor as an Atticia's. That would be the only job I ever said that you could even – ever, if anything went wrong in, in New England, you could see Bill Belichick taking and would be that giant job. You, you saw – I think it was a football life where he basically cried in the bowels of uh, Giant Stadium. Yeah, I, I, that shows you what he felt about his time there in the organization. Yeah, I would. I mean, they do some great names, and obviously, uh, as this week goes on, uh, they'll become more and more of a possibility, and, and we'll catch up again next week. Uh, a game has to be has to be played. It, it could be Tom's last one: Giants Eagles Sunday afternoon, uh, Week Seventeen. A pair of six and nine teams, but obviously for the Giants, uh, there's a lot more involved in this one uh, than just uh, deciding on a trip to London for you guys or not for next year. This was fun, guys. We will do it again next week, and and we're going to have a lot to talk about, no doubt about it, as we get into the off season. Uh, and the Giants probably make some changes here. Jordan, thanks for doing this, and uh, we'll catch Anytime, up. Anytime, Joe. Absolutely. We'll see you when week 17 in the season is finally over. That's right. Thanks, James. Mercifully. No problem, Joe. Thank you. Mercifully for sure. It has been a long <laughs> one, uh, but it looks like it's going to get very interesting for the Giants. And thanks to all of you for listening to episode 37 of Talk is Cheap. You can follow the show at Jordan Renan, at James Cratch, at Joe, Joe Gileo Sports on Twitter. And, of course, subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher to Talk is Cheap. We'll be back with you next week, probably to talk about a lot of changes around the New York Giants. Thanks for listening.